2 Timothy and chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll look at a familiar and powerful text here this evening. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And you can look for verse 6 when you get there. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. We're going to look here at uh, the, the Apostle Paul, one of the uh, heroes of the New Testament as far as the uh, um, ministry and as far as Christian living goes. Certainly walking with the Lord, he was a faithful servant of the Lord. And, and this is, as far as we know, the last letter that he wrote. And so we're looking at uh, one of the later points in his life as he's reaching the conclusion of his life and ministry. And we're going to see the great strength and the, the good finish that he came to. You know, it's good for us all to live a life strong and stable today, uh, but it's not just important for us to live for today, but also to understand that we want to live in such a way that will enable us to continue. Uh, you don't want to, I know we had that prayer letter and I was talking about a gas shortage. You, you don't want to uh, run your vehicle all the time uh, without considering that one of these times you're going to have to fill up again. <laughs> you're going to have to gas up. You want to be able to keep going on the journey until you reach your destination. You don't want to just drive like there's no tomorrow uh, because there may be a tomorrow and you may need to continue going. And so also in our Christian life, we don't want to just run our Christian life off the rails today without considering that we want to finish well in the Christian life. So we're going to see the Apostle Paul and his fabulous finish as he concluded his life and ministry in, in the best of ways. Now, you might say in the best of ways. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> but at least his walk with the Lord was strong and his testimony was real. And we're going to see the power of his life tonight as we look at a brief summary of that. So let's start by looking at our text 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness you've shown to us to give us this testimony of faith and the testimony of the apostle that as he lived and labored for you, that he uh, left an example that we could also follow after as well. We pray that we would be challenged and encouraged tonight to imitate him as he imitated also Christ. We pray that your, your power and your word and your truth and your spirit would enrich our walk with you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the title of the message this evening is... A fabulous finish. The Apostle Paul, he did finish his ministry and his life very, very well. The first uh, first thing that we'll notice in the context is that he says, I am now ready to be offered. He was ready to face the end of the journey. He understood that he was in prison in Rome and that he was about to stand before the emperor. And he had done so before. In fact, later in the chapter, in verse 16, he talks about that. He says, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. The first time he stood before the emperor, uh, nobody else wanted to go with him. <laughs> Everybody else was too scared or too intimidated. Uh, I, I, I think I've, uh, I've got something else on the calendar, uh, Paul. I'm sorry, I can't quite make it that day. You know, uh, Everybody just disappeared, and he had to stand alone. But not alone, because Christ stood with him. But here he was preparing again to do the same thing. And he understood the serious risk of that. Um, God had spared him the first time. But on this second time to stand before the emperor, he knew that it was very likely that he would not have the same outcome. And so here he is, ready to be offered. And it's good for us to live our lives in such a way, as we'll see the apostle in the points that we're going to look at this evening, that he lived a life in such a way that he could say, I'm ready. You know, I'm not... I'm not trying to get things fixed up in my life so I can stand before God. He said, I'm, I'm ready. I, I don't have anything else I need to finish. I don't have anything else I need to accomplish. I am doing what I need to do. I have done what I needed to do. I have stood where I needed to stand. I have fought where I needed to fight. I have been doing what God has called me to do. I, I'm ready anytime. And that's the life that God has always told us to live. Uh, the Lord t told us that he would one day, of course, come again. And uh, that it would be without warning, like a thief in the night. He's not going to give us a bunch of signs to indicate that he's coming soon. Thieves don't do that, okay? They just show up completely without warning at the time when you least expect it. Jesus said, at the time when you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And so he will come when he is least expected. But we need to be ready. And that's the constant challenge that Christ gave to his disciples. 
be ready be ready you know those servants that the lord has left in charge of things he said boy how are they going to how are they going to receive their lord's return if they've been misbehaving the whole time he's been gone they need to be ready and doing right and standing for right and living right all the time that he is gone and so we ought also to be ready like the apostle we're going to see three aspects of his testimony the first aspect is of course the fight he says i have fought a good fight in verse 7 i have fought a good fight and we also have a fight to fight. <laughs> it might seem like uh, something that when we talk about this, people who don't understand the scriptures and don't understand the word of God think, boy, these Christians, they talk about fighting. <laughs> you know, uh, I've many times thought about having a series of messages on the spiritual warfare of the Christian life and uh, may, may someday be led of the Lord to actually do that. Uh, but can you imagine visitors coming in and, all right, uh, welcome to Lake of Baptist Church. We're, uh, we're having a a series called uh, having a warfare mentality or you know something like that and they're going what <laughs> what are these people about uh, are they fighters I thought Christians were supposed to be peaceable and gentle and kind-hearted people well we are but not with the devil <laughs> because our adversary has always been the devil sometimes we get confused about that sometimes we get uh, get crossways with people and we start to get distracted about who the real adversary is but our real adversary is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour and that is the devil satan that old serpent and uh, the deceiver he is the one who has been fighting against us from day one and he is the one with whom we war he is the one whom we are seeking to have victory over day by day by day we wrestle not the bible says in ephesians 6 with flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places and so it's that spiritual adversity that we fight against in fact in first peter 5 and verse 9 it says of that adversary whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world and so we do have an adversary and we are to resist him we are to resist him steadfastly we are to unyieldingly stand against uh, his his wiles his deceits his onslaughts and attacks that in faith we can have victory over that in first john chapter 5 it talks about this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith faith is the victory right and so that's why we see here in first peter 5 9 that we are to resist him in the faith we have faith we have the the, the truth of god's word we can stand upon that knowing that we can have victory and understanding that the same afflictions are accomplished in our brethren that are in the world you know you're not the only one fighting the old devil <laughs> You're not the only one fighting against sin and temptation. You're not the only one fighting the opposition that spiritually comes against you in your walk with the Lord. He is attacking others as well. And so the battle is not just about you and I. The battle is also to stand on behalf of others, to stand in prayer for others and to plead the blood of Christ over the brothers and sisters all around us in the, in the faith, to, to plead for those lost ones that Satan has deceived and blinded, that they will be delivered from the bondage of his deception. Uh, we are to pray and, and to spiritually war for others as well. With a world all around us uh, dying without Christ and multitudes of people who have heard the scriptures and have come to Christ and become Christians, uh, many of them being deluded and deceived, uh, we cannot afford to sit idly by and not fight for the truth. We fight against the devil, but we also lie, uh, fight against the deceptions uh, that are being spread in this world. Now, our world's full of deceptions. Our world is full of lies because the, the devil is the prince of the power of this world. He is the one who uh, influences this world's system and this world's mindset. And, and he's a liar and the father of it. And so we should not be surprised when we see all kinds of deceits pandered around this society. And some of them we should not worry about too much, okay? Uh, there's all kinds of lies that you could spend your whole life chasing lies and trying to rectify uh, inaccuracies. And sometimes that's tempting. <laughs> because sometimes we see things that are being told and, and promoted and propagated that are fallacious and deceptive. And we want to correct it all. But some are less important than others, right? Some of the lies that are being spread in our society today, you can spend your whole life fighting certain lies that are not as significant as other lies. For example, if you see uh, something uh, you know, being spread about uh, some sort of political thing that you know is not true, you can spend your whole life fighting about political lies and trying to get the truth out there about politics or about um, some sort of you know, human thing. 
that I understand there's value to that, and I'm not demeaning those things. But how much more important the spiritual lies when the devil's telling people they can get to heaven on their own good works and that they can they don't have to trust in Christ and they can just be a good person. And those lies will send somebody straight to hell. Uh, those are the lies that primarily we should be emphasizing the truth against and fighting against those kind of lies. There is tremendous uh, power in the, the battle that we have to fight against the devil and against the deception. And so we want to stand for the truth. Um, we have an opportunity to stand with Christ and stand for the truth. In uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Uh, we are uh, soldiers in the Lord's army, and we do stand at times with, uh, with a division between us and others. He said, I came to send peace. Um, not peace on the earth, not peace, but a sword. There's division where there's separation between those who stand for Christ and those who stand for the world and the devil's ways. There will be divisions brought by the truth. You can't help that. People will say, oh, you know, I don't want to say anything about that because that's too divisive. Well, sometimes the truth is divisive and sometimes you just got to tell the truth. You don't need to be divisive for the sake of being divisive, but sometimes you need to stand for the truth. When people are being misled and people are being pulled away from the gospel message of Christ and the sufficiency of the Savior, people are being pulled away from the truth of, of salvation by grace through faith. So we sang already but this evening about the grace that is greater than our sin. It's by grace through faith that salvation comes. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And when people are being deceived about the truths of salvation and about the, the truths of their own eternity, then that is something that Christians need to stand up and speak up about. It Sometimes we, oh, I don't want to offend people. Well, how much worse are they going to get offended than if they go to hell without hearing the gospel? That They're going to get offended by that, right? But we need to tell people, we need to continue to proclaim the message of Christ. We need to continue to, to bring the truth of salvation and the truths that combat the lies of the devil to the world. And sometimes it's in, in the gospel and sometimes it's in other areas of life that we need to carry those messages of truth to fight against the devil. And that's what the, the Apostle Paul was doing. He was in constant warfare. Now, you don't find anywhere in the scripture record where Paul takes up a sword for the cause of Christ. You don't find him ever using physical violence for the cause of Christ. Though that was his pattern before Christ. Remember, he was dragging men and women into prison and, and uh, he stood by at the, uh, the martyrdom of Stephen. He was used to using physical violence. But when he came to Christ, it was no longer about that. He did not use that in his warfare. He said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so also we find that we too can stand and fight for the truth and fight against the devil to stand for what is right and holy in our world today. In Ephesians 6 and verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, why? That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And so God calls us to withstand in the evil day. And you might say, Pastor, is it the, the evil day? I think every day is the evil day. <laughs> I mean, we've been living in these, these last days since the time of Pentecost, and certainly every day from that day to this has been an evil day. Uh, sin has run rampant throughout our society, and there have been ebbs and flows of, of strength of God's people and ebbs and flows of revival and soul winning, uh, but every day there has been a lot of evil in this world. And so I don't care what day you think it is, it's an evil day, and we need to withstand in that evil day. We need to be able to, having done all, to stand. And that's where Paul was. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have done all. When I have done all and then reached the end of my journey, he said, I stood I stood in my uh, armor uh, as a soldier of the Lord. I stood ready to fight against evil and against sin. And I stood when there was danger uh, fearlessly to stand. Now, this is a good metaphor for where he was right then, right? Because he was about to go into the lion's den again. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was about to stand before the emperor and face his very life. Too many Christians are standing idly by while truth and righteousness are assaulted. I don't, I don't think we should get too caught up in a lot of the um, side issues of life as far as truth and ministry, though, though you can you know, uh, proclaim the truth in, in any area, and it's a good thing to do. 
but particularly when it comes to the truth of scripture and the important doctrines that we hold to that carry the truth to change lives. We need to stand by the truth. In Isaiah 59 and verse 14, it says, But judgment and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. And it really grabbed my attention to that phrase, truth is fallen in the street, because sometimes it feels like that in our society, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it feels like truth is fallen in the street, and nobody's bending over to pick it up. And rare it is that someone even trips over it. Sometimes it even feels like truth hasn't fallen in the street. Sometimes it feels like it got a push, right? Somebody stuck out their foot and gave them a shove. But that truth has been so abused and been pushed around. But it's good for us as God's people to stand up and hold to the truth, to stand up and fight for right. Not with warfare and not with a warfare attitude towards people, but by the love of Christ and with a faithfulness to the Lord to stand against the spiritual adversary. If you look just to the previous chapter, it might be across your page as it is for me, in chapter 3, you look to verse 8, it says there, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. He's talking about the false teachers who will come in these last days. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, In these last days, perilous times shall come. These are the last days we live in, when people will uh, stand against the truth. It says these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Uh, These two Jannies and Jambres, we don't have their names recorded in the Old Testament, but these are uh, two of Pharaoh's magicians in the court of Pharaoh who withstood Moses and tried to tried to overthrow Moses' message when he came in and stood before Pharaoh. Um, We don't have those names recorded for us in the Old Testament, but now we know their names. So if next time you're reading that in the Old Testament, you can go, aha, I know the names of those two rascals. Jannies and Jambres, those are the Greek forms of their names. Obviously, they weren't Greeks, they were Egyptians. The English forms of those two names, Jannies and Jambres, would be John and Ambrose, for the sake of interest. But these were resisting the truth. And there are those today who will resist the truth. But you and I can, with courage and conviction, stand with grace and with truthfulness to proclaim the spirit and the truth and the power of Christ. We don't want spineless Christians. We don't want spiritless Christians. We want powerful Christians, truth-bearing Christians. So the first aspect of the Apostle's testimony was, he said, I have fought a good fight. He had given his strength and his heart into what was needing to be done. The second aspect of his testimony was the finish. The finish. He says here, I have finished my course. I have finished my course. This gives us a, an image of a, a race to be run. <laughs> he says, I have I've finished my course. I have finished the the track that I was running on, I have reached the conclusion of the race, and I finished it. I didn't leave anything undone. The course that we take determines the finish that we achieve. There are all kinds of different metaphors and illustrations we can use when we talk about running a race, but you got to run the right race. you got to run the race that you're meant to be running. If you go to a track and field event and you're meant to run a certain race, if you're running on the wrong track, guess what? You're not going to succeed in your race. <laughs> You're not even on the right track. He said, I have finished my course. He finished the course that was set out for him. And the Lord has given to each of us a different race to run. Now, they're all very similar, but there are some slight differences and varieties in the path that each of us take through life. They're all based on the same truths, and they're all based on the same Bible, and we all have the same salvation, but some of our journeys will look a little bit different in some ways. And so each of us has a course to run. Don't run in somebody else's course. Sometimes we can look to other people and think, man, I want to be just like that person. And we try to pattern ourselves so much after that person that we're not listening to the Lord's leading for our life, right? And it's good, like the Apostle Paul said, be followers of me as I am also of Christ. It's good to look to people of strong Christian virtue and good character and faithfulness to the Lord and learn from their example. But part of their example is that they're running the race that God gave for them. It's not trying to, to... totally imitate somebody to where you just want to be a carbon copy of that person. Because if God wanted a carbon copy of that person, he could have just made a carbon copy of that person, right? Every one of us is a little bit different in, in, in the light of God's infinite creativity. 
he has made us all a little bit different. and so all of our races are slightly different. we each have our own course. don't try to run everybody else's course but but ascertain in your life lord what wilt thou have me to do like paul said on the road to damascus as as still saul of tarsus what wilt thou have me to do and run that race like paul did. he took that course that god had set for him and he said i'm going to run my race. i have i have this race, this course that god has set before me and i'm going to run it and he had run it and he had run it very very well. we can make all the choices and decisions in life about races and which path we're going to follow but the bible tells us in proverbs 14 and verse 12 it says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death and so there are lots of paths that you can choose in life and just because it seems like a good idea to you or to me doesn't mean it is now, the paths that seem right to me uh, can lead to disaster uh, there there are so many times in life where i thought I think I know how to do this. And I had a plan and I had an agenda and I had a schedule and I thought, I know what I'm going to do. And uh, it was not <laughs> the way to do things. Have you ever tried to make something or ever tried to fix something and you were sure you had it figured out? And then when you're finished, it was worse than when you started. <laughs> I've been there. Try and fix something and go, man, I thought for sure I knew how to fix that. Now it's even more broken than when I started. The way that seems right to us is not always the way. God's word tells us this is the way, walk ye in it. And God gives to each of us a journey to follow and a path and a course to run. And we must choose to follow that path. We must embrace the journey that God gives to each of us, not with frustration or discouragement because our journey is different from somebody else's because it's very easy, isn't it, to look at somebody else's journey and get jealous. I wouldn't mind running on that track. That looks pretty smooth over there. <laughs> you know, my track's pretty bumpy. You know what? All the bumps smooth out from a distance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was very much helped years ago when I read a, I think it was an email devotion from a, a faithful preacher, and he said, you know, sometimes we think uh, it's a bump in the road, and he said we need to realize it's a bumpy road. <laughs> it's not a bump in the road; it's a bumpy road. <laughs> you know, the journey through this this life in a sin cursed world is bumpy. And so we can't look at everybody else's journey and think, oh, I wish I had the smooth journey that they've got. They just have bumps you can't see. You know, everybody's life is bumpy. The whole journey is bumpy. There are bumps in everybody's pathway. And so we must just focus on the path that we have got to run for ourselves. If you run in the race, watching everybody else run their race, you know what you're going to end up? You're going to end up crashing. <laughs> You're going to end up tripping, you're going to end up in a ditch, you're going to end up hurting yourself, and you're certainly not going to end up finishing as well as you could. You need to keep your eyes focused on the path before you. Judas had a plan. It didn't turn out very well. He had it all figured out. He thought he could have his cake and eat it too. And it ended in disaster. We might want to look at other people sometimes and see their journey and think, oh, I wish I could have theirs. Probably none of us would pick the Apostle Paul's journey. <laughs> look at the journey he took. We might think, oh, I wish I could have his results. Somebody once said, oh, we all want the Apostle Paul's results, but we don't want his methods. <laughs> right? Uh, he, he, was, he was faithful and he was diligent and he was perseverant and he put his whole heart into that course that God had set before him. And it was difficult but he embraced it and he ran that course. We might not run the same course as anybody else, but by God's grace, we can run with the same enthusiasm as anybody else. <laughs> we can run with the same grace from our Savior as anybody else. And if we will stand in the power of God, we too can finish our course with joy. We too can, like the apostle, say, I have finished my course when we get to the end of our journey. I don't know when the end of our journey is going to be. Each one of us, it might be... Uh, a huge variation of difference when that'll be um, I mean it could all happen tonight but uh, when we get to that point that we reach the end of our journey we can like the Apostle Paul if we'll stand faithful say I finished my course God gave me a path to run and I've run it you know none of us is going to get to the end of this journey sinless but we can if we'll be faithful say you know by God's grace I've stayed on the path you know I've I've, I've blown it here and there but, but by and large, I've stayed faithful to the purpose that God gave me. I've run the race. I've been faithful. I've done the work God gave me to do. And I want, I'm going to stand there and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because I've been faithful. And I've stood for Christ and I've run my race. 
Too many Christians want to finish well, but aren't very good at following well. Everybody wants to break through that tape at the finish line. But you know what comes between the start and the finish? A lot of running. <laughs> I've never been a big runner. My legs are way too short for that. Uh, my brother and I are the same height sitting down, but he's a lot taller when we stand up. I got short legs. My sister always used to joke about me wearing fat little boy pants uh, because uh, because my legs are short. Uh, they just are. I'm not a runner. I, I don't have the endurance and I don't have the leg, leg length. I'm not a runner. But I will tell you this, that if you want to finish the race, it's a lot of running. It's a lot of running. I remember one time going out running when I was a teenager with some friends. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> well, I was so tired. I was so exhausted. My heart was pounding so hard, I thought I was going to explode. Obviously, I didn't. But running is hard work. Mm -hmm. And between the start and the finish, if you want to finish and say, I have finished my course, there is consistency, there is diligence, there is a lot of labor and effort enabled by God's grace. Certainly, the journey is, is a good journey by God's grace. But it's not all you know, tulips and roses. Uh, we do have to do the work to finish the race. Mm -hmm. And it takes consistency. Uh, you don't get to just do half the race and then get to the end and go, ta-da, I finished. <laughs> no, we got to stay faithful and consistent in our walk with the Lord and finish that race. A lot of people want the crown, but they don't want the course. You notice in verse number 8, it talks about the crown. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. We all want the crown, right? But you notice verse 8, the crown, comes after verse 7, the course. I finished the course, and henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not for him, not for me only, but to all them that love his appearing. We must love his appearing. Now, I believe that that means that we are looking with love toward the day when Christ comes, but that may also mean that we love every time God shows up in our lives, that we are constantly seeking his presence and appearing in our lives day in and day out. We must finish our course. The third aspect of his testimony is the faith. We've seen the fight, the finish, and the faith. He says, I have kept faith. He didn't quit. He didn't back down. He didn't give up. Others had fallen away. And you can notice that just two verses later, three verses later in verse 10, it says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. The other two had gone for different directions and other reasons, so we won't pick on them tonight, Christians and Titus. But Demas, he said, he's forsaken me. He's left the ministry. He's left me. He's, he's headed for the hills. Why? Because he loved this present world. And there are a lot of things in this world that, that are trying to seduce us, right? Yeah. Sometimes, it's, it's, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's popularity, sometimes it's entertainment, sometimes it's uh, sensuality, sometimes it's um, occupation, sometimes it's a lot of different things that are trying to seduce us into the ways of this world. Mm -hmm. And we cannot afford to fall into the trap of the, the snares of the world. He wouldn't go back like Demas. Others had fallen away, but he said, I didn't. I kept the faith. I did not change. I did not back down. I did not give up. He had not been one who had been laid aside or lost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he talked about not wanting to become a castaway. He didn't want to disqualify himself from the race and from receiving the, the, the award for having finished the the uh, um, well we'll call it the race I was going to use another word to try and get something else out of that um, he he wanted to get that get that reward for having completed his task you know what um, there's a lot of it seems like racing has become really popular in in the last I don't know ten years lots of races Spartan races and five five k runs and ten k runs and lots of people are doing runs these days and. A lot of these times, I've, and I've had friends who participate in these sorts of things, and if they participate, they get a medal. That, you know, they were a participant. Um, you don't get that if you don't finish. <laughs> you don't get that if you didn't keep going and actually finish the run. And so he wanted to hold fast to the faith that he had been given. 
Now, the faith here, I believe, refers to the body of doctrine that we hold to as Christians. The faith. That's generally what you, what you mean in the scripture when you see the faith. He's not talking about, I had faith. He, he said, I kept the faith. This is the body of truth to which we adhere. The system of faith that we hold to. And he said, I, I kept that. I didn't change my beliefs, I didn't change my doctrines, I didn't change my practice as a Christian. I kept to the truth that was revealed to me by the Lord. And there's so many people that are wavering, and so many people that are changing their doctrine, and so many people that are going other paths and getting sidetracked with all this other stuff, and far too many of people that I've known even have changed their doctrine and gone down other paths, but he said, I didn't do that. I didn't get sidetracked by the world, I didn't get sidetracked by other doctrines, I kept the faith that God had delivered to me. In Jude, it talks about uh, earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. You know, we didn't have uh, multiple revelations of, of doctrinal truth. You know what? God gave us the doctrine in the scriptures, and uh, we didn't need anything else after that. It was once delivered to the saints. Uh, through, the, through the apostles and the revelation of scripture, uh, we got all the doctrine we need, and we need to adhere to it. We need to stand for it. We need to not give up on it. We cannot afford to back down from truth just because it becomes unpopular or because it becomes inconvenient or because become, because it becomes convicting in our lives. Uh, I think sometimes people change their doctrine because the doctrine they have makes them real uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They think, oh, well, that couldn't be true. That makes me feel miserable. Well, maybe you're miserable because you're not right with God, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you're not living for the Lord. People change their doctrine. He said, I'm not changing. I'm not backing down. God gave me this, and I'm not letting go of it. I must hold fast to the to the truth that God gave to us. In Hebrews 2 and verse 1, it says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. We must give earnest heed, not just casually listening to truth, but he said we must give earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Not just to hear, but obviously then to live and to understand those things, Lest at any time we should let them slip. Don't let those truths that God has revealed to you through the scripture and through the preaching and teaching of the word of God to, to be casually, uh, a casual interest in the message of God. Let it be an earnest heed. Lord, teach me. Help me understand this. Help me embrace this. Help me live this. I don't want to let it slip. Mm -hmm. It's like if somebody was to throw a pass. You want to catch it and receive it and not drop the ball. And that's kind of the idea that I take from that verse there in Hebrews 2.1. Not to let it slip, but, but that when it has been delivered and you have heard those things, that you have received them without dropping the ball, without letting them slip through your fingers. You know, we don't need, we don't need to, to let go of something so precious. If I was to, you know, toss something worthless out into the crowd tonight and one of you didn't catch it, we'd be like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. But if I was to toss something that was very precious out, I, I, hoping that somebody was going to catch it, you know, we would give earnest attention to, oh, this is something precious, this is something valuable, this is something fragile. We want to make sure it's preserved and cared for. We would give great earnestness to that. And what is more precious than the words that we've received from the Lord through the power of the Scripture to give us revelation of truth and understanding? We must hang on to those and keep them. That's what he said, I've kept the faith has the idea of guarding it like a, a military keep, the protection of a keep, a fortress. He says, I've kept these things. I have guarded them. I have protected them. I have upheld them, and I have preserved them. I have not dropped what was passed and handed to me. We might see people in a sporting event uh, of any variety receiving a pass, receiving a, a ball thrown to them or a, a puck passed to them or something of that nature, and they try very hard to retain that because there's there's a game on the line, right? How much more when there is our walk with God on the line that we might let the truth slip by our lack of seriousness about our Christian walk. We might lose uh, the grasp of the truth that God has given to us. I don't think that people who go from, from a place of solid doctrine to a place of corrupt doctrine did so from a place of earnest heed and passion for the doctrine that they had received. Yeah, right. Now, I've never been in that position where I've gone from solid doctrine to corrupt doctrine, at least as far as I know. <laughs> but, but my thought is that it, there must have been a lack of attentiveness to truth to have let it slip. Mm -hmm. 
as we see in, in Hebrews 12, uh, 2 and verse 1. We must give earnest heed to these things lest we let them slip. There must be this passion to say, this is so precious, I will not let go of it. I will not reconsider it. I will not reevaluate it. I will not allow any distraction from it. This is what God gave me, and I know it's the truth. And I'm not going to dabble in anything else. That is where we must stand. So this is the testament of the apostle. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. And here's a man who had a fabulous finish. I mean, it's hard to disagree with the, with the testimony that he had to his last day. And there have been so many that I can point to in my life that I've known who got to the end of their journey finishing strong. And they got to the end of their journey and they were going as fast for Christ as they ever had in their lives. <laughs> when they got to the end of the journey, their faith had not slowed, their faithfulness had not slowed, their, their love for the Lord and for souls had not slowed or dimmed at all, but they were still pressing on. And that's where I want to be. I don't want to slow down and coast into the end of my journey. I want to keep picking up speed. One thing about running a race that I have learned, not from personal experience, but from hearing others talk about it, is that when you're running a physical race, the second half should be faster than the first half. Right? If you talk to anybody who's a runner, they will tell you, that if you're gonna run effectively and to the best use of your energy, the second half should be slightly faster than the first half. Because you're that that's the most efficient and effective way to run. I, I don't know, I'm an expert, I don't claim to be an expert, but you ask runners, they'll tell you that. The second half should be a little bit faster than the first half. That's how I want my Christian life to be, picking up speed, not slowing down. Let's keep picking up speed, let's keep picking up strength from the Lord. You know, the more that we walk with the Lord and learn the Lord's ways and understand his truth, the more ability we should have by God's grace to, to walk more fully in the spirit, to walk more fully in the truths that we learned and understood and known and held to. We can finish well, each and every one of us as God's children. We can finish strong. You know, physically, it's quite normal in the physical existence for energy to run down the older you get, for physical ability to run down the older you get, the body starts to slow down. Sometimes the mind starts to slow down. That's a natural part of this human existence. Our frailty humanly, we've talked about this even recently, talking about the resurrection and the rapture in our uh, Sunday school lessons. Physically, things tend to slow down as we age. But that's not the spirit. There's no reason the spirit should ever slow down. It's not limited by a physical body. <laughs> it's limited only by our lack of faith. And I want to continue to press onward. And I want us as a church family to continue to go forward with more and more passion, more and more zeal for Christ, more and more fullness of the Spirit as the days progress, that the day that Christ comes, we will be closer to Him even than the day before that. Let's pray. Father, help us who labor this day, whether this be the day of Christ's coming or not, mm -hmm. that each day we would take the next day seeking to grow more closer to you, to more faithfully serve you, to more passionately and powerfully live in the life that you've called us to live, running the course you've set before us with faith, with endurance, with courage, with conviction, with compassion, that your work in us would mightily impact this world for eternity and that you will be glorified through the lives that we lead. Help us, Father, to dedicate ourselves to you tonight and to afresh and anew come to you saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What is my journey today and what is my journey for tomorrow lord lead me each step of the way we ask your help in jesus name amen I, um.